another Gamer's Guide to Feminism. This episode is going to tackle a concept central to the unique interactivity of video games. Instead of examining video games as a series of still images, like many feminists who examine video games do, we're going to explore gender in video games through the accepted third wave feminist theory that gender is a performance. Yay! Yes, third wave feminism has something positive to contribute to gaming. D do you need a minute? Just, just, if you have to, hit pause and, and, and walk that off. But before we get into that and blow your mind, we need to address a related concept that comes up in this context a lot. Something called the male gaze or gaze theory. The male gaze is a term credited to second wave feminist Laura Mulvey in her 1975 essay, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema. It basically means that mainstream films are overwhelmingly crafted based on what's appealing to men, and this affects wardrobe, camera angles, and choice of subject. The male gaze also avoids things that men are assumed to find uncomfortable to look at. In other words, not these things. Or these things. Well, okay, one could say Naked Dorian is still the male gaze, but not straight male gaze. We'll get to why that's relevant in a few minutes. The concept of gaze theory originates with psychiatrist Jacques Lacan. Existentialist philosophers like Simone de Beauvoir and her partner Jean-Paul Sartre dealt with gaze as the impacts of awareness that you are being watched. <laughs> The concept of some sort of gaze has been used in various places, including medical examinations and prison populations. But the male gaze is best known in pop culture. It's undeniable that the vast majority of film, television, and even video game directors are male, and people include things in their art that they themselves find interesting and appealing. The part where it gets much trickier is that the male gaze isn't just about that. The male gaze also deals with the fact that people of all genders who make art for profit try to predict what their consumers are going to like, and too much media is catering to the stereotypes surrounding male desire. There's an extra layer of this that applies to video games as well, a concept called the imperial gaze, which depicts other cultures through the story of a Western protagonist. Okay, don't freak out. Saying something happens isn't saying that something is evil. If you want to hear words like pernicious, there are other feminist video game series out there you'll probably like much better. Look, there's no denying that a lot of TV shows, film, and video games are made for men. Still, we need to be cautious regarding assumptions. The film Brokeback Mountain and its ensuing marketing campaign was a movie about gay cowboys, but it was crafted to appeal to women. You can have a male experience with a female gaze, just as you can have a woman's story subject to the male gaze, or whatever you want to call targeting media at men that doesn't make you freak out. Again. None of this is evil. The problems start when there's too much media created for one group and not enough media created for an equally populous group. Kind of like when there were too many shooters being made in video games. Some people loved that, but for people who didn't like shooters, there wasn't as much stuff for them to play. And some people were even treated as weird or less of a gamer because of a preference that was equally valid, just different. Still, being too reliant on the idea that games are, by default, aimed at men leads to some inaccurate analysis. If you assume the Super Mario games are aimed at men, then Princess Peach is seen as some objectified prize for the presumed male audience. But if you take Nintendo's stated target of families as the baseline for analysis. The intent of Princess Peach is to give girls representation. If the Mario brand was created today, that would probably have been done differently. But it's undeniable that the stated audience for Nintendo's original Nintendo Entertainment System was families. Some proponents of the male gaze will claim that this is proof of an overriding male domination of society. But some little girls legit like pink poofy dresses. I don't get it. I hated pink when I was six, but I wasn't the norm. This presumed female preference for the color of pink and the corresponding presumption that boys don't like pink can be instructive. Here's a standard game franchise marketed predominantly to boys. Here's Nintendo's marketing. Notice all the pink? We can't presume a male audience. In the 1970s when Mulvey was writing, it was much easier to pinpoint the influences and outcomes in media. But at that time, video games looked like this. 
A huge shift happened in the 1980s, driven by two giant movie stars, Stallone, Schwarzenegger, in Beefcake Cinema, 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 Cinema. That was more monster truck than movie announcer. Anyway, Arnold Schwarzenegger was cast in 1982's Conan the Barbarian strictly because of his looks, and he needed extensive dialogue coaching because his English was inadequate for a leading role. Schwarzenegger's Conan is a classic example of reduction to body and reduction to appearance objectification. The thing that mattered to film producers was Schwarzenegger's muscles. It's important to note that both Schwarzenegger and Stallone used performance-enhancing drugs to obtain these hypermasculine physiques. They set a standard for other men that's impossible to achieve just through diet and exercise. Even when actors don't use drugs, the diets they're put on to achieve these superhero physiques are so extreme, they cause side effects, including nausea, headache, and bad breath. And I'm not just talking coffee breath or morning breath. Bodybuilder breath is a unique kind of stank. This is where gaze theory starts to fumble. Based on male gaze theory's heteronormative paradigm, these beefy guys should be put in movies to appeal to women. But action movies are made predominantly for male audiences. If we follow male gaze theory, the implication is that men are aroused by these hypermasculine beefy guys. Movies aimed primarily at women feature less muscular men. So who exactly are these muscles for? This is the critical flaw in male gaze theory. It's based on stereotypes regarding sexuality. Instead of treating people like individuals with individual preferences, it assumes that movies aimed at men overdo the skinny naked white women because most men prefer skinny naked white women. I was completely disabused of this notion when I produced Ed and Red's Night Party, a TV show with go-go dancers, porn stars, and topless women in a hot tub. The most popular dancer with viewers of that show was a size 16 black woman, and this feedback didn't come from politically correct civil rights types. This came from guys on weekend drinking benders and dudes who watched the show in prison. Yes, a teachable feminist moment came via the inmates at Toronto's Dawn Jail. Male gaze theory is over 40 years old. It came into fashion when many people still thought homosexuality was a mental illness. It's been rendered essentially obsolete by intersectionality theory, which teaches us that you can't treat individual men as though all men are the same. Intersectionality rose up in part because radical second wave feminism was more than kind of racist. The 1960s were a time when marriage rates for African American women were beginning to plummet, so Betty Friedan's housewife blues didn't resonate with a growing group of women who couldn't relate to those problems. They were also more interested in civil rights and poverty reduction than the nuances of advertising, since that advertising was really only for white women. The feminist debate on the gays creates a lot of conflicting statements within feminism. For instance, Bell Hooks, who gamers know mostly through a filter that makes her look like nothing more than a raving lunatic, suggested the idea that white cinema was a place where black men could look at white women without risking harm to themselves. The reason? The white woman on a movie screen couldn't perceive a black man as a threat. We can apply this to the sphere of gaming, where a lot of male players feel like they themselves are perceived as threats due to their curiosity about the female form. Gaming has a solution. Dead or alive volleyball. <laughs> now, this means that media has a lot of power, since it can send strong signals regarding which women are considered okay to look at. Because there's so many skinny, surgically enhanced white women in media, and so few women of other shapes, sizes, and colors, those white women are seen as acceptable to look at, even seen to be encouraging the dreaded male gaze. So men focus their attention on those women, and all other types of women feel invisible and unwanted. Why? Not because men actually prefer the skinny white women, but because society has given men moral license to look at the skinny white women. But there's a flip side to this. Media glamorizes the men in media too, even the nerdy, femi, and just plain strange looking ones. Not judging. This immediately gives these men status, and that status gives them the ability to reject lower status women, hence weird looking rock stars marrying supermodels. Meanwhile, straight women pay positive attention to high status men while they dismiss lower status men as creeps. Guess what the low-status women and the low-status men have in common? Many members of both groups play video games. Hooks' oppositional gaze theory kicks in, and both groups use fantasy worlds to look at forbidden fruit in a safe setting. Add a multiplayer component, and that setting becomes 
much less safe, defeating the potential positives of this sort of gaze and leading to a great deal of conflict. You might have noticed. There's no denying that some features are seen by society as ideally feminine and ideally masculine, but real people exist on a spectrum between and beyond these two waypoints. The art of drag, for instance, involves bold hair, makeup, and other gendered markers that allow a performer to perform in opposition to their everyday gender. That's what makes drag different than a person being transgender. Drag performers overshoot the feminine ideal and end up performing in a state of exaggerated femininity, which is why they seem to share makeup tips with Pamela Anderson and Lady Gaga. Actually, I think those ladies swipe their styles from the drag queens. All of this is gender as a collection of cultural identifiers that doesn't hinge on who's doing the looking or the person's actual genitalia. Welcome to Judith Butler's gender performativity theory. In her 1990 book, Gender Trouble, Feminism and Subversion of Identity, Butler argues that gender isn't an identity. Gender is a performance. Butler rejected the idea of women as a class and argued that feminism, in promoting false commonalities among all women, had reduced the options for individual women instead of broadening them. Now, Gender trouble isn't without its contentious statements. Butler decided to out de Beauvoir Simone de Beauvoir and claim that it wasn't just gender that was a social construct. Both gender and sex were social constructs. Yeah, not touching that one. Fortunately, we don't need to go there for purposes of video games because there is no biological element in video game characters. We can use Butler's theories as a tool to look at gender in video games because the potentially goofy parts don't apply. So. How does this work? The idea is that there's no definitive gender identity. What we think of as gender is actually a collection of culturally accepted performances that signify gender. Gender, according to Butler, doesn't exist outside of expressions of gender. Essentially, gender is what you do as opposed to what you are. How does this apply to games? Let's start simple. Pac-Man doesn't really display any gender one way or another. We only know he's Pac-Man because of his name. Ms. Pac-Man, on the other hand, has lipstick and a bow on her head, which are clear signs of a female gender performance, and improved graphics that allowed those items to look like more than blobs. Getting more complex, many games allow you to select the gender of your character, but whether you choose a male or female protagonist or other, for those of you who care about that, the basic plot of the game remains the same. There may, however, be certain times when the game makes the gender of your character relevant. Which characters you can romance, how certain characters respond to you, and possibly even gender-specific wardrobe. Players enjoy being able to choose their gender in games because gamers like choice in general, so the ability to choose how the game responds to your selected character adds to the fun. Some games, like the Saints Row series, even let you change your gender mid-game and allow you to pick a voice and clothing for your character that may or may not culturally align with your character's body parts. In other words, you could have a female character who wears a suit and sounds like Nolan North. In-game character genders are a collection of culturally recognized visual and audio cues, not sets of plumbing. The way a character runs, sits, stands, and speaks are all performances that signal feminine or masculine characteristics. But, as the bugs in Assassin's Creed Unity so helpfully reminded us, video game characters are all empty inside. The lack of internal sex organs is important because video game characters don't have the real-life challenges that intersex people do, unless a game developer places those into the plot. This is probably a good thing. If we view video game characters like real people from start to finish, then the process of character customization is a non-consensual medical intervention. Do you really want to go down that slippery slope? I don't. That's why I prefer to keep video games in the realm of art as opposed to hardcore sociology. Players don't really experience games through pronouns. Players experience games through actions. Too many things in video games are assumed to be for men, when in fact there's nothing about them that should inherently repel women. Still, many aspects of being a woman in video games are subversive gender performances, which is why some women are the most foul-mouthed trash talkers you'll encounter in multiplayer. This is unladylike behavior, and that's precisely the reason many female gamers do it. 
Some games even play with subversive gender performances as part of world building. In Dragon Age Origins, the Golem character, Shale, has an androgynous voice and is bitter because her previous master diminished her by treating her like a literal object that pigeons pooped on. The player doesn't find out that Shale is definitively female until quite late in the game. There are also some video game characters intended to have no clear gender at all. The Toads from Nintendo's universe are a genderless race where individuals take on gendered characteristics. Toad and Toadette could be used to teach Judith Butler's gender performativity theory. But the most familiar use of gender performance in video games is as a shorthand to explain gameplay. This is especially true in early 8-bit console games that required storytelling with minimal words. To explain why a playable character had to perform various athletic feats while scrolling across the screen, games used familiar gender performances as a shorthand to package unfamiliar gameplay mechanics inside tropes a player could understand. The hero that saves the princess, the King Kong type gorilla that kidnaps a woman, and a mama kangaroo rescuing her joey were all used to quickly communicate what the player was supposed to do in the early days of gaming when video game user interfaces were unfamiliar. Seen through the lens of gender performativity theory, the dreaded damsel in distress isn't a commentary on the natural state of women. It's just an extremely overused gendered performance. Butler encouraged people to perform subversive acts of gender that defy the traditional gender binary in hopes that these subversive acts will expand the understanding of masculinity and femininity. That's why we want to see women in diverse roles, not because there's anything wrong with wanting to be a male hero that saves a pretty girl. The first great subversive gender performance in video games was Samus Aran in the original Metroid. Players in 1986 didn't know Samus was female unless they beat the game in under five hours. When this condition is met, the player sees Samus without her helmet. Beat the game in under three hours, Samus is in a sort of bodysuit. Beat the game in under an hour, and Samus is in a pink bikini. Many feminists see this use of Samus' femininity in a negative light, since it's viewed as a sexualized reward for presumed male players. However, gender performance theory approaches it in a different light. This very feminine woman underneath that power armor is only revealed when a player helps her excel in a decidedly masculine role. It could be seen as a metaphor for anything boys can do, girls can do too. And those sexy ladies in video games are also a form of gender performance, tossing out the traditional feminine virtues of modesty and passivity all in one go in a defiant testament to feminine strength. Yes, they might be spank material in private moments, but while you're playing the game, that lady is your in-game avatar, your body in the game world. There's no evidence to prove that all men are choosing female avatars because of some sexual fantasy, as opposed to being curious about performing as a woman in a fictional realm, or because they just like her moveset. <laughs> Video games have the potential to be a great way for people to explore gender, provided that influential people keep the process fun, and don't try to make everyone miserable. I know. I know, that's exactly what a lot of feminist analysis does. Why do you think I keep making these videos with almost no funding? I don't like being told the stuff I like is evil any more than you do. For many gamers, male and female alike, subversive gender performances are part of the fun of video games. We can express parts of ourselves that result in negative judgments in the real world in a safe environment. The problem with feminist analysis of video games based on the so-called male gaze is that it places blame on male gamers for creative decisions they had no part in. Modern Western video games have become obsessed with the presumed male audience, so they're stripping out pieces of female gender performance in a benevolently sexist attempt to protect women. This is exactly the negative impacts of second wave feminism that Judith Butler warned against. Remember Conan and those superheroes we talked about off the top? They're a type of masculine gender performance. Men don't associate Conan the Barbarian with ridiculous musculature because they're all aroused by it. They make this association because society says that big muscles are an appropriate gender performance for male superheroes, even though real life martial artists and athletes usually aren't nearly as beefy. In fact, that much muscle mass decreases flexibility to the point some bodybuilders can't even wipe their own butts before competitions. Don't Ask me how I know that! Ugh. So why do we perpetuate this hyper-masculinized gender performance in video games while systematically stripping out similar feminine performances? For example, the same people who scream that Rainbow Mika is sexist say that Ryu is 
hot. According to male gaze theory, our Mika's costume is sexist, Ryu's costume is sexy, because things that appeal to men are inherently oppressive, whereas things that appeal to women are emancipating. But according to gender performativity theory, both of these characters are similarly exaggerated gender performances. So in that light, the double standard, pretty sexist. If our goal is true equality, we need tools that encourage this, not analysis that reflects a situation from 40 years ago. In the age of Twilight, supernatural and squealing over shirtless Thor, we can hardly say that the content and balance in the media is anywhere near what it was in the 1970s. It's true that video games have some catching up to do regarding a less stereotypically masculine point of view. but. I think I provided evidence that male gaze theory isn't going to get us where we need to go. Many gamers struggle with issues of masculinity and femininity, and games allow us to explore these concepts from multiple angles. Unfortunately, thanks to the dated tools used by the accepted feminist approach to gaming analysis, massive parts of feminine performance are being removed from video games due to fear of pissing off some angry mob. This isn't the inclusivity you're looking for. Hey, that was Star Wars. <laughs> Women aren't immediately offended by breasts. We see them every time we take a shower. What's offensive is the idea that breasts should somehow define us. Gamers deserve the full spectrum of the feminine experience, including women who make choices we may disagree with. We can't, with a straight face, say that nudity and sexuality is okay, then censor it out of our entertainment content. The parts of third wave feminism that you don't tend to see on the internet are working towards precisely this goal, including the various types of women who are marginalized by the second wave's women as a class approach. Okay, we might not have a big platform on gaming sites yet, but third wave feminists have meaningful roles in the music industry, politics, and popular TV shows. And that is it for this episode. Thanks for watching. If you like what you see, please subscribe and see you next time when we touch on our final piece of critical theory, cultivation theory.